Oh, that's me. Right. Loads and loads and loads of gin, a little splash of tonic at the end, it's just like all you gin guild fanatics like your drink, and that's what we'll have <laughs> immediately after this. Uh, on a wet, windy afternoon uh, in January, Nicholas gives a call and asks me, would I like to come and make some drinks after one of the gin guild events, which I said yes. And he also said, I might want like to talk a little bit about uh, Fever Tree and our part in the gin renaissance uh, that we've just all happily uh, gone through, which I said I'd be delighted to do, because more often than not, I have had little chats with distillers around the country and they tell me how easy it is to be a tonic compared to a gin because, you know, you've got all these things going on and then, you know, you get all the sales with the tonic behind the bar. Is that? Yeah, it's been really easy knocking the number one global brand of tonic off its little pedestal. But, you know, I, I will sort of go through that, but I'll also try and show you how we have, uh, we think, supported and carried our weight. Obviously, there's been some iconic moments uh, in the last sort of uh, 20 years of gin. I mean, I know Leslie's in the room, like Hendrix came along and changed the perception of gin. I was stood in front of a wall of vodka and, you know, I had gins behind the bar, but I could count them on my hand. I had like 40 vodkas that all tasted the same and that's what I was convinced I had to have as a bartender. And then Leslie made something that was cool and sexy that was a gin and it wasn't just bartenders drinking it. Um, Jared's here as well, Sip Smith, who changed the law so we could, you know, have the excitement and the category and all these things going on. And I'd like to think what we did was make sure that people could appreciate what you're going on. And that's our whole raison d'etre, is to make something that makes you shine. You're Batman, we're Robin. That's our job. <laughs> um, it started with gin, obviously. Uh, so uh, some of you may know, can you hear me? I'm very loud as I walk away anyway. But uh, uh, some of you may know Charles uh, owned Plymouth Gin. So in the 90s, uh, the investors that had it, it wasn't doing very well. It was losing like 25 grand a week and they wanted rid of it. And uh, Charles and three like-minded men decided they would take on this uh, amazing brand that maybe lost its way a little bit. It wasn't doing that well at all. And gin as a category in the 90s was not sexy. It was vodka. It, you know, it wasn't the coolest thing in the world. But he went in there and he believed in the story and the brand. And he put the love, care and attention back in. He managed to sell a lot of stock they had left to Asda. And he got them involved in it as well. And then what he did as well, Simon Ford, who already had a mention uh, uh, with Forge Gin, he actually hired Simon, who I think was probably one of the first gin ambassadors around the world, and he was the man from Plymouth who was sent to New York literally with a little suitcase of gin, and he wandered around and changed the fortunes of the company. So in the time that Charles was there, they went from losing 25 grand a week to making 3 million quid a year. That was noticed by some of the larger drinks companies, uh, one of which was Absolute, which took it on, and Charles walked away from there uh, with a little bit of money in his pocket and quite excited about the gin and tonic category. Uh, this is how Tim and Charles came together. So uh, Tim uh, had left uni, he was working in marketing, and he could see gin was coming. So this was in 2003. It seems obvious now, but it was not then. We had, you know, gin, we had had Martin Miller's, we'd had Tanqueray 10, and Hendrix that had come along and changed our perception of gin, but it was not like it is now at all. Uh, you know, we, it's quite easy to forget. For those of you that weren't, you know, I'm a bartender first, I would sell five, six cases of vodka a week and I'd be selling a case of tonic, and that was in a bar, that, sorry, gin, and that was in a bar that was selling quite a lot of it. So it wasn't an obvious idea, even at that point. But when they sat down and they had a discussion over coffee, which I'm always a bit disappointed it was over coffee, but they had a chat over coffee, uh, one of the things that stuck in Charles's head, so gin, is, I don't need to tell you all, is such a diverse uh, spirit. It's, even though the, the, some of the botanicals may be very similar, it's, got, it's like a fingerprint. It's only a little fingerprint of flavor, and how you put those botanicals together are going to give you that distinct taste. And in Charles's head, and Simon's head indeed as well, when they're doing these tastings, people, when they taste the gin neat, they could tell what it was. When they made martinis with it, they could tell what it was. But when they put tonic in it, it, they couldn't tell the difference between the gins anymore. And that stuck in Charles's head. He mentioned it to Tim, and so that conversation turned to a tonic. So they walked away an hour and a half later. They were going to create a gin together, so now they're going to make a tonic. Again, I sort of liken this to wheels on a suitcase. Now, I'm of an age where everybody was walking around airports with their arms extending round, you know, dragging off, trying to catch up their children, and it was like a, well, it's like a kettlebell exercise you see in CrossFit now, but at the time it felt like torture. But, you know, the suitcase has been around for a long time, wheels a little bit longer than that, but nobody had thought about putting the two together. Once you've seen it, you're never going to not do that again, and that's why I always compare this to much to Tim's actual horror when I talk about it, but it's like, it, it's an easy idea afterwards, but nobody had it till then. And there's a couple of people, uh, and I was with Nick Strangery this week as well, he remembers when Charles first came around to him and suggested that we're going to make a tonic. He's like, seems like a great idea, but I can never see it working. Jake Berger tells the story as well. But it, it, it did work quite well. So I'm going to try and not sound smug as I go through the story. And one of the things I promised Nick I'd do as well is try and point out some of the, maybe the bits that changed the game for us. And if, if you know, people that are on their way on that journey as well, I'll point out things that we did, whether we knowingly at the time or not, that made all the difference. 
So if there's any questions I go through, I'm quite loud, just, and I tend to wander with the subject, so I might not come back to it. So if you have a question, leap in as you go. Um, the first thing Charles wanted to do was put the best ingredients in. So they literally went back to the books. Uh, Tim went to the British Library and found everything he possibly could on tonic and was looking for ingredients. Now, Charles is a very well-traveled man. I don't know if anyone knows Charles, but he's had his own little plane for a long time. He likes to nip around the world anyway. So he was already interested in these exotic, wonderful ingredients that existed around the world. And he had no truck at all with anything artificial or any false flavors. He wanted to put the best he could find around the planet. And that is our brand and that's our story. And I'd say that's a big part of our success because that's what we tell people. Tonic is not as sexy as gin. Like there's nothing, you tell people it's a tonic tasting, they're not coming, okay? So I've never done a tonic <laughs> tasting in my life. I do gin tastings with tonic as it goes along to that. But this is the story we tell. We talk about ingredients, we talk about where they come from, we talk about the farmers that we have relationships with, and we talk about the flavors that go in our gin. So I kind of say, uh, I, I work, you know, around gin a lot, like nearly all my week is, is talking to gin brands, and a lot of the stories are the same, and I'd, I kind of say to you, that's the first thing I'd look at, are you telling a story that's worth repeating? And that's the most important thing I'd say for you, I, you know, people like stories. We've had amazing data, uh, you know, we've had, you know, Rachel doing amazing science stuff, I don't understand any of that, I'd like to, but I'm not the brightest kid in the block, but a, a story I can remember, and that's going to help your consumers, and that's what they're going to tell their friends, so this is our brand, it's talking about our ingredients and where they come from, we generally believe it's the best ingredients we can find we're still searching for it and I'd say the other key to this is people if you see a fever tree advert that person works for fever tree it might be because we're a little bit tight we don't pay models but it's also uh, it's the actual people there so the person in the middle is Rose she started as running our events when fever tree first started she's now head of innovation liquid innovation she's having a wee break now she's just made a couple of wee babies but uh, she's coming back soon um, uh, Tim obviously down there Saskia who is our head of marketing Saskia did the first ever fever tree Christmas party in 2005 when the four of them fitted in a cab bet the chat was diamond that night uh, uh, but she's still here, she's still running the marketing department, uh, and obviously Tim uh, working there, and even me, they even let me go out sometimes. Uh, the matching sunglasses was an accident, I didn't know I was going to be matching the uh, oranges I was picking in Sicily that day, but you know, this is, this is what, m when my guys come round and I'm teaching them to talk about gins and I'm talking about, about other mixes and everything, it's always about the ingredients. And I just want them to walk away, if they recognise one flavour and they take that with them, that has been a big part of what we've done and trying to educate people to do that. Um, I like to think we've carried our weight. So these are just some statistics we put together since I've been at Fever Tree. Since I, I shared an office with Tim and Charles when they first started, uh, when the brand was small. I was working for Martin Miller's at the time, back in 2005. And then when there was a sales team of Tim, uh, I joined in 2012 as, as a sales manager, which is still my position now, not a promotion in 10 years. That's, that's how I'm felt over in the company, of course. But, <laughs> Uh, my background is as a bartender and essentially it's, it's kind of through sales through education. I generally believe the best way to build the category and build everything through is to let people firstly have a connection with it but also understand it and a story is, is going to be the, the, the way to do that. So we did gin cases. So we, by my reckoning, we have half a million people of gin drinkers. These are hardcore gin drinkers, which we reckon there's something like 7 million people who repeat order gin in the UK. I've sat down for an hour, not me personally, I have a team, there's a few of me now, but we've sat down and talked about not just mixers, we've actually talked about gin. Again, they're not coming to a tonic tasting, they're coming to a gin masterclass. And that's been, again, I'd say to yourselves, we're looking for a story, we're firstly looking for a quality product, which is obviously the most important thing. If the liquid's not there, it's not after as well. But it's a story we can share and a point of difference, because if I'm talking about four gins, I don't want four London Dries. I love London Dry. London Dry to me is the definition that I see, you know, when I think about gin, I definitely do. But if I'm sharing it with other people, I want to make everybody happy in the room. I guarantee, not today perhaps, but any room I've ever stood up and spoken in, there's always about 5% of the room who aren't gin drinkers who've been dragged in. My job is then to make sure that they love gin before they leave. So it's usually tonic they don't like, which is annoying for me, but good news for you. But uh, uh, yeah, so that's, that's what we've tried to do. And I'd say, you know, um, help us in this. So the brands that we use are the brands that have worked with us, who have a story to, a story to share, and they're likewise helping us do it as well. But you know, that's a big part, that's sales through education. And then sharing the flavours. So uh, downstairs we've got a trestle table with drinks on it, much to poor pal's uh, disappointment that we didn't bring a lovely bar like they did last year. The reason being, all our lovely bars are being used right now across the UK at events. We've got the Polo one, we've got Ascot next week, we've got Spritz trucks across uh, London as well. We really, really believe that the biggest difference you can make is put a drink in someone's hand, and a big drink's even better. So Rose, who was on there picking rhubarb before, like, you know, she's kicked it off, but we reckon a million people, we've put a full-size drink ourselves as a company into someone's hand. And I think that, you know, a story and a flavour together, that's going to make the biggest impact on a consumer. 
quite often I'll see people do one or the other, or they'll have a great product, but they won't share it. They expect that's enough now, the public will then find it. That's just not the way at all. You've really got to go out and keep trying. And, you know, we're doing okay now. We're quite a big brand, but we're telling the story now more than we ever have, just because, you know, other people have noticed that tonic water might be worth giving a go too. So, you know, never less than your laurels. So, yeah, this is what we think we've at least helped as we've gone along. Um, another thing we did in 2014 was gin and tonic menus. Now, it wasn't our idea, it was Spain that did it. So we, Spain was the biggest market for me. So when I first joined Fever Tree, that's what Tim used to hit me over the head with. Why couldn't we sell as much gin and tonic as Spain did? Um, when our, I'm a bartender, I used to work in the cocktail bars and things like that, but when our creativity went into cocktails, Spain really went mental about the gin and tonic and every connotation of it from the copper glass and all these things that went out there as well. And it was, it was amazing how much choice there was in fact, it's like we are now. This is the choice there is now for us, but they, they got it first. And they were using menus to educate people or basically just to help them at the bar. So we started adopting that. So it's Marcus who looks after Spain for us. He said we should try the menus and we did. And it was a proper game changer for us because we have choice. 2014, we've got choice in gins now. Thanks to Jared's work, you know, changing the law. There are local gins or different gins. There's the big, beautiful brands that we knew and loved before. But instead of them just being on the back bar, what the menu did is it actually brought them to life. Because when people, it might not be the person that's drinking gin that's at the bar anyway so the menu sat down so it was a proper game changer and it allowed them to make use of the back bar so um, you know some bars will be stuck in 12 14 gins but they're only selling three the menu turned that around it's not always a good news if you were paying to be in the well because we kind of ruined that for you as well I do apologize but one of the big companies we're working with who uh, family owned brewery not too far away uh, they had 80% of their gin sales was the well brand that paid to be there and 20% of the bat bar. We did, uh, we went and did a, a staff training with the staff and we put a menu in. Within a month, that had turned its way all the way around again. So it just made, it brought the bat bar to life, which was incredibly beneficial for obviously the bar because they're pulling more cash. Cash is king. The, the margin of these products was really, really helping as well. And it's, you know, that, that space back there is important. It's always very annoying to me when I'll go into a bar, you know, I'm a big whiskey drinker as well as gin and, you know, they, they claim they've got the most whiskeys. I don't want the most. They want the best. You know, it's the same thing with gins. You want to have a range that's interesting to people. And you want to have something local. You want to have something interesting, something from around the world. And I think that's the way that the menu can help bring that to life. And also about pairings. Uh, I don't know about you, but if you work for Fever Tree, essentially, if, as soon as you tell anyone that in a party, they then ask you, what should go with this, 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 of one of the 6,000 gins that we've learned today that exist. But I try my hardest to get around them. It's a terrible job, but, you know, I'm, I'm working on it. But the menu was a game changer. We've put like tens of thousands of these out across the free trade uh, in the UK. Um, the data now, it, I don't have much, obviously, because that small blip we've had in the market, but even by 2018, uh, it was still improving. Uh, but a lot of that is your work, guys, as well. You've put gins out there that are interesting, that are fascinating. We've actually had to keep up with you now. So from having, we had Mediterranean as our flavor range when that first menu came out, but as gin became more diverse, as our customers became more diverse, we had to try and keep pace with that. So yeah, the menu is a game changer. I think it also points out that we work best when we work together. Uh, I think gin, probably more than most other spirits. The customer doesn't think of it as a single entity. It thinks of as final drink. They think of gin and tonic or martini or Martin Negroni. So when we think of just gin, I think we're not doing the customer a service. We need to connect the two together. So that's what a menu does, whether it's a cocktail menu, whether it's a gin and tonic menu, whether it's spritz menus that we're putting out there with some of the fruit flavored gins now as well. You want to make that final drink for both the operator, because they are looking for guidance, uh, but also for those consumers to make sure they're getting everything they want out of it. Um, this is a slide with lots of data on it. I know nothing about data. I was given this by a very clever man called James that works in the company. But hopefully, and what he told me it showed, was how we've hopefully helped bring premium spirits up. So I refer to my friend Tom Nichol. Tom used to be the master distiller of Tancred and Gordon's. He now wanders the world in his retirement as a little gin gypsy. But um, he talks about how a great gin can be ruined by a bad tonic. But even a good tonic can even make a bad gin drinkable. So that's his part of it. It's hard for me to say that. That sounds very smug and arrogant about it. But, you know, we've allowed people, hopefully, to discover your gins in the way that you want. And that's been our job by making sure that we are as good as we can be, but also not too good. Like, we've had definitely products that have come through using flavors that we loved. But when we mixed it with gin, we, we didn't think the gin was shining. And we will back off from that. We're not a soft drinks company. We're a mixer company. And that's been a big part. It's very annoying for the production company, because I usually see it in its last sort of six months of development. But Matt, that's great, but I can't taste the spirit. It's no good. So it's, that, that's what we're trying to do. So it's, you know, think about that finished article. It's also a little problem I have with gin tastings, that we only try them neat. Your customers don't drink them neat. I, I 
have a gym brand myself. And I remember the first time I, we, we did it and we got it to, we really, really wanted it neat. And then we made a drink with it and we're like, okay, we start again. So it's, you know, you've got to think about what the customer's going to have and also from grading it. And also if something's a 97 or 95, what does that really mean? That's my sort of opinion on that. But I'll shut up now before David hits me. But um, uh, yeah, so it's bringing on that whole category and just, you know, having them enjoy it. So I, I do remember my wife, uh, having a friend, like someone new, moved into the village and she moved into the pub and said, we knew it was a good pub because they had fever trees so they cared about what they do. And that was like, a, she's like, you're about to be really happy when I take you into my kitchen. But it's that whole sort of fact where guests are looking for those indications of quality, be it ice, be it bat bar, even to the humble tonic that's behind the bar. It does make a difference now. Um, it's not just on and off. Now, I'd also say, uh, whether we did it on purpose or not, I don't know, but we, we've developed, we've always been pretty much 50-50 on and off trade. Obviously, that's had a serious blip in the last couple of years as well. But that has been probably, well, it saved us in the last couple of years for sure. But as a, com you know, as a younger company, if you're coming through, I try and go that way, it, whether it's farm shops, whether you're selling yourself locally and stuff like that at all, but have that second revenue stream. Because people drink, you know, they're drinking better at home, I think. When we, had, we brought out a second cocktail book during lockdown just because people were asking us so many questions. What should we be mixing? How could they do with what the stuff they've got at home as well? So I would say to try and you know, split that revenue across as many ways as you possibly can, uh, just for your own reassurance, because you don't know what the future is going to bring, as you know, has been quite harshly pointed out to us in the last three years. But this is also a little bit of a brag slide that, uh, yeah, we're doing all right. I'll buy you a drink downstairs. Uh, off trade. So um, we were really lucky. Like overnight successes don't happen overnight. As you know, like Charles and people in the room that they remember the first time that Tim and Charles came to see them. It was many years before they then saw the bottle anywhere. But we were really, really lucky that the Waitrose Bar did recognise that the market was ready for a, a, a mixer to come out, a premium mixer to come out. And they did give us a call quite early, and that did give us an off-trade presence a, a lot quicker than most brands would have had in their natural growth cycle. Um, working in the off-trade, we've learned an awful lot, actually. Uh, but the, the most important thing, I'll, I'll get onto the slide, but there's a couple of stories I'll say before that. So it's working together. So when we, we got our first ever gondola, which was a massive thing for us, I think it was about 2000. 14, but not that long ago, uh, with Bombay, and we got that as well. And obviously our scale, because we put the two together, which you don't often see for some ridiculous reason in supermarkets, because we put the two together, our sales obviously skyrocketed, but we lifted Bombay rate of sale and that sold by 300%. Well, that little us helped do that. Do you know what I mean? It, that's what the sort of thing I'm saying. This is recent data. So this is not only lifting sales, it's, it's, it's discovery to the category and discovery to your brand. So that's what I kind of say. But it's also how you approach these stores as well. So I don't know if anyone remembers the old uh, soft drinks bar. You probably don't because you're working spirits. You didn't have them. It's David. But he uses a story now about when we first got into Tesco's and then we started to do a little bit well is when you get the call to come and see them in their office. And, you know, they're going to encourage you to do some sort of promotion and work harder with them. And Tim said, no. And he's like, what? He's like, I'm not going to come to the office. And I'm like, this is not how it works. What do you mean you're not going to come to the office? He's that. No, we're not going to come in. You're going to come out and have a G&T safari with us. He's that. Am I? He's like, yes. And, you know, please bring the team. And, and he did. He was intrigued enough to do that. And he came out. And what we did was we set up, you know, instead of having this, well, like I'm doing to you, I guess, he brought it to life. We took him to a pub. We took him to a restaurant. We took him to a great bar. We took him to, you know, the place around the corner that we all look in and drink and said, these are your consumers. These are the people that drink our product. So these are the stores we should be in. Because it, it sounds great if you're in 3,000 Tesco's, you know, but if you're not selling in all those places, it doesn't work. Do you know what I mean? So you need to be in the right place at the right time. David now uses that as an example of how to engage with Tesco. Like, don't just do exactly what they say. Look at the category and look what does best for its customer, because that's what he's trying to do. His biggest interest is what he's doing with the brand. So just think of that yourselves. It's not about how many stores you're in. It's also not always about how much money you're doing. So we've, from an early day since I've been there, even today, we'll walk away if someone's asking for too much, because I'd rather put that money into customers that have stood by us for years that will do things. And sometimes it hurts, and sometimes it's not always the right thing to do. But the people that want your money now, they don't care about you, and next year they'll take the next bit of cash that comes along as well. So like, it's, a, it's, a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So you know, that's what I'd sort of say to that. But like, off trade, is again, working together is key. So we're together there and that will help us both. And that's, your voices are as strong in that as ours. So, you know, don't go on promotion on your own. Let's go together or if not with us, with, you know, whoever you're gonna go with, let's build the category because, you know, a rising tide floats all ships, obviously. Um, if you're not in a supermarket yet, I appreciate that was a crap slide, but we are trying there too. Uh, John Lewis uh, do a Christmas cracker every year and they pick a gin distillery from their immediate area. So I'm not saying we have, 
that much, we have some influence over this, but you guys do too. So if you've got a John Lewis near you and you're making gin, start telling them now, because they're thinking about Christmas already. But you know, this is the way to do that. It's, it's people discovering your brand, finding your brand, I and mean, we will have some big brands in there as well, but it's about trying to bring people to new flavors, because that's what they want from us. They ask us continually, what should they be trying? What should we be doing? How do they match it together? And we rely on you for that as well. I, I've not tasted every gin out there by any way or means. I'm trying, as Emma knows, but, uh, you know, that, but we, we need your help in this as well. So you know, bring stuff to us and we will try to help as much as we possibly can. This is the bar. So this is our bar. So this is what Tim built me during lockdown, God bless him. It used to be the worst bit of the office. Now, how this is relevant is the whole left side of that is gin. So we present to all the major supermarkets. We present all the groups in the UK. Uh, we have the top in there, end on all the time. So you're allowed to come in and use this and you can bring customers into this, and it's there for you, but we're also talking on your behalf in that bar as well. So when we've got Waitrose or Asda, which we've both had in, you know, in the not too distant past, that's what we're doing with your brand. And they get a big long presentation all day, and then I get them a wee bit tipsy at the end of the day, and it's pretty much carte blanche. There'll be, there will be set agendas, there's things that they want to go through as well, but we'll be pulling everything we can down and putting things forward. So the more ideas and things you can share with us. So when we ask you for a bottle, this is what I'm doing with it. It's not going back to my house. Some of it is, but you know, not all of it is going back as well. Uh, we also have our team in there as well. So there's a few bands in the room that have done it. You're very welcome to come down. There's 150 people in the office. You're very welcome to come down and chat to them. You know, there are 150 people who drink gin. So uh, if you want to come down and have a chat with them, and also you usually we tag it on the back if you've met marketing or some of the other parts of the company, you can have a little chat to the team at the end of the day, which is always great. But yeah, I, lo I love my bar. That's where I sit when I go in. Um, this is Tim's favourite slide, so it has to be in every presentation by law. Uh, so uh, we've attracted attention from a broad audience. So there's Tim up in the big house meeting Liz, uh, which obviously has some favouritry, which he's very proud of. We're also in the Queen Vic, which I know it seems ridiculous, but when I, was with, when I first started with the brand, I could name every single place we were in in the UK. And then to see yourself on television is quite exciting. So, so, you know, when we went in there, that was great as well. Uh, Ryan, although he's not such a big advocate now because his wife's making tonic, but, you know, these things happen. He's done well with gin. I suppose that had to come when it went through as well. But Tim's favourite slide is the one at the bottom because that's the Hatton Garden robbers planning their heist. But they're all sat there drinking a g and with Fever Tree in the pub around the corner. He adores that slide. And he uses it everywhere. But I guess what we're saying is, you know, we are, we've got a wide audience and we're in a lot of different places. So, you know, it, it, we, we can help uh, uh, gain access to them for you. What we get from a pub that we're in is we know exactly how much the gin they're selling because we've got all the tonic. So we can help you hopefully focus your attention and where we can work with together. So again, please feel free to take advantage of that. Um, strawberries. Should we talk strawberries again? <laughs> Right, so uh, we're a fairly hardcore audience. Um, I'm not anti-pink gin, and I like the banana and the groni, I'll just say that now. I think we should be listening to people as opposed to what we're doing. I mean, this is a, this is a very well-educated, very purist audience, and I totally get that, and Emma's looking at me because she's had this argument with me many nights uh, as we go through as well. I do think that any cocktail bar I've ever worked in, the raspberry drink sold the most, and that's a fact. It's true, Emma, isn't it? It is true. So it's how you do that with integrity. So I've had a couple of key moments. I talked about Tom before. I don't know if anyone knows John Ramsey. John Ramsey used to be the head blender at Edmonton. He was the nose responsible for Highland Park, McAllen. Uh, uh, he was the guy that put Highland Park 18 together, which considered one of the finest whiskies in the world. I once had to make drinks beside him with his whiskey. I was a little bit petrified in case he stabbed me. But uh, he was talking about Highland Park and everything, and then I was shaking it up with some lemon juice, some heather honey, and a strawberry. Uh, just immediately, after, just one though, uh, with it afterwards when I went through. And he talked to me about the integrity of the spirit. So we are doing lots of flavors, but we do them for a reason, and we're still thinking about you. So, uh, Anne, just to make you happy. So we've opened a bar up in Edinburgh uh, in the airport, and the third best-selling drink is with a rhubarb and raspberry with Bombay Sapphire. So it's, it's pink gin, but you know, with quality ingredients, and we're doing the best we can very can with it, but people want that. So we need to listen. I think we, we, the way I look at it, when you've got, I mean, it was almost as big, you know, it was like 10% of gin drinkers were drinking pink gin. If I can keep 10% of that 10% to me and bring them into me, I'm delighted with that. And that's all I'm after. I'm not going to get everyone, because some people are jumping on the bandwagon. But that's the game. None of us started drinking, like, you know, I adore Tanqueray, I, I, I adore those sort of classics. Now, that wasn't the first spirit I drank. The first wine I drank was not Bordeaux. The first beer I drank was not, you know, an IPA. We all start off with something else. So if we can pull them in and instead of pointing and, you know, blaming them, you know, try to educate them as we go along, we're not going to get everybody, but that's the way to pull that through as well. And also the category is so diverse, but also 
uh, you know, people, like, there's a lot of chat about tequila, how it's shooting up and stuff as well. Gin's amazing. Like, when you look at the, the, the amount of gin in the UK and the amount of interest and the education in gin is huge at the moment. And I still think one of the things that we are still finding our feet with is the occasions when we can be doing gin together. So, you know, the, the gin you drink at home is probably not the same gin as you drink when you first go to the pub. Still not the high tempo, low tempo environment. There's still lots of scope there to do it with. And again, that's what the flavours are for. They're for different occasions, different people, you know, different times of day in my world. Maybe you're, well, not in your world, you start drinking at 10 as well. But you know, that's, that's, that's what it's there for. And again, communication. Now, that's, it is quite a simplistic wheel. We have a more complicated wheel on the website where you put in a spirit, you put in a mixer, or you put in a flavor you like. We come up with a pair for that. There is an algorithm. I don't understand that. I just drink the gins and tell them how it works. So that's all I do. But yeah, if your gin's not on there yet, just complain to me because it is my fault. Uh, the airport bar, so that's Laura who runs Scotland for us. Um, yeah, so we don't want to compete with pubs and bars in the UK, but we do want to know what people are saying. Uh, data is incredibly important, but we also want to be able to, like, instead of say, what, ha what would happen if we do this, what if I just do it? So when I open the airport, I say, ah, it's actually another guy called Craig, there's two of us, but I'm up there every other week now making drinks for five, six hours in the bar and just want to see what people are doing. And also I'm trying to coach people off beer, I'm trying to get people off wine and you know, I'm trying to educate them and you know, bring them into the club. And that's, that's what it's there for. Uh, and we're going to try and do this globally. So again, there is that massive opportunity globally, which Chris pointed out for all these other countries. That, and it's a way to get people trying a gin and tonic. The classic gin and tonic is the number one drink on the bar. It's beating coffee, which I'm delighted about, because we open at 4 a.m. I was like, we, we're not going to be a coffee bar, are we? I don't do the 4 a.m. shift, definitely not. But um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's doing incredibly well. It's 50% up where we are. And flavors that are not given as much focus perhaps in other markets because we can do it and we can we can put it how we want it or flying so yeah that's a, a red drink for a reason uh, and then yeah final slide which i made tiny because i'm not very good at tech uh, so this is eventually saying uh, uh, you know that global opportunity is there uh, we are the number one mixer by value in the uk uh, it's the same for america we, we, we've just got america and we also got ginger beer which has been amazing and these other markets but there's you know there's only a few countries up there that there are loads of countries we can do together uh, and as you know as kathy and everyone said like it is it's not the easiest thing to export but we can do it together and together is definitely the way to it like we'll know people in the country you'll know people in the country and you know it's, it's better as a team my light's gone red i better shut up <laughs>